Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome back Professor Mary Ellen O'Connell to moderate this next panel. Many of you met her yesterday and found her to be a very engaging speaker, and I know she has made furious notes throughout the last 24 hours and is anxious to be back to tell you more. Um, I'll just briefly reintroduce her for those of you who weren't here yesterday. She's the Robert and Marion Short Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame Law School, where she teaches contracts and international law. She's a prolific author. She's written a host of articles that I will not list for you today, uh, but her vita is available online if you'd like to pursue it there. Uh, I do want to mention, though, that she just came out with a book of her own titled The Power and Purpose of International Law. Some of you, I hope, had the honor of purchasing that and asking Professor O'Connell to personally sign it. If you haven't been able to do that, I highly recommend it. Uh, she's our moderator today, and with her are Professor Philippe Sands, who's a professor of law from the University of College of London. Some of you who were here yesterday uh, enjoyed his remarks at that time. He also directs the Center on International Courts and Tribunals for the University College of London. Uh, he also directs the Project on International Courts and Tribunals. Next, we have Noah Weisbord, Professor Noah Weisbord, who also was with us yesterday. He's currently a vis visiting assistant professor of law at Duke University School of Law. He's currently a delegate to the Special Working Group on the Crime of Aggression established by the Assembly of States Parties to the International Criminal Court. And finally, to my far left, your far right, uh, Dr. Robert F. Turner, who co-founded the Center for National Security Law at the University of Virginia School of Law, and he currently serves as its uh, associate director. Professor Turner also chaired the ABA Standing Committee on Law and National Security for three terms and served as editor of the ABA National Security Law Report for many years. Please welcome back our panel. For as many questions as I've been getting recently about closing Guantanamo Bay, I think I've had far more questions about the topic we're about to take up, and that is who within the United States government might be held accountable for violations of international law, in particular war crimes and uh, human rights violations. And that's the topic of our discussion for this afternoon. I understand why our organizers saved this topic to the sleepy hour of the afternoon. I think it's one that is incredibly compelling, um, one that is going to be very much on the mind of top um, uh, officials of the new uh, Barack Obama administration. We have a wonderful panel. We want to go right to them. What they've uh, agreed to do is no more than 10 minutes to just set out their basic um, position on this question, who and, uh, might be held accountable and under what law and where. And then, um, to the extent that they have not picked up some of the uh, interesting and compelling questions that the students have forwarded to us, I've selected some of those that I may put to them um, if need be, and then we'd like to have a really uh, a good period of time for questions and answers from all of you because I'm sure what they will say in their remarks and what you have on your minds right now will lead to a lively discussion. So that's all I have to say, um, and we'll hear first from Professor Sons. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Th th this is a an important topic, but it's also a very delicate topic because it raises some difficult issues for any society about what to do when a crime has been committed. Um, it's important just to put things slightly in context here. Firstly, let, let, let's be clear about what we're talking about and speaking from my own perspective. And it's been very useful to have some sidebar conversations, people. We're not talking here I believe, about widespread and systematic acts of torture. There have been acts of torture. Those constitute international crimes, and they fall within the jurisdiction of the Convention Prohibiting Torture, which obliges all state parties to investigate and, if appropriate, prosecute, failing which, to extradite to a country where there will be proper investigation or prosecution. So that is the law in this country, it's the law in my country, it's the law in 153 other countries.
countries. There have also been acts of uh, inhuman, uh, cruel, degrading treatment, probably on a much more widespread uh, level. They are, of course, subject to a different legal regime. Under the Torture Convention, there is no obligation to prosecute and extradite uh, in such circumstances, but they constitute uh, war crimes. Uh, and in that context, they are capable of being investigated and prosecuted under the uh, universal jurisdiction theory uh, in any uh, country in the world that is a party to the Geneva Conventions, which is a great number of countries. So somehow we are going to have to grapple with the reality that assuming crimes have been committed, let's just take that as an assumption and work from that, what is to happen? Now, I've been having an interesting conversation with Joe Margulies. I've noticed he, on every occasion he can, has stood up and uh, uh, made the point, which I know is shared by many others, that uh, actions were taken by people always in good faith. I, I, I differ from him, not because I believe that these acts were not done in good faith, but because, firstly, uh, I, I don't make any assumptions about faith one way or another. I just don't think we still know enough about the precise decision-making uh, circumstances. But because, frankly, at the end of the day, uh, the issue of good faith or not is neither here nor there in terms of whether or not there ought to be an investigation or a prosecution. You cannot ever torture someone in good faith. It becomes a sentencing issue, not an issue as to whether or not to investigate uh, or prosecute. So I think that whole issue needs to be put entirely on one side uh, and put oneself in the position uh, of a uh, investigating or prosecuting judge who is faced with facts uh, which raise the question, what do I do? And of course this is a real issue uh, that the next administration uh, is going to have to grapple with. And whenever I've been asked the question, should there be investigations or prosecutions in this country, I've sort of dodged the issue. Uh, I've dodged the issue partly because uh, I'm an outsider and I feel before the Congress of this country I ought to respectfully uh, limit myself to the things that I know uh, and limit myself in particular to the view in that context, let's establish the facts. Once the facts are established, it will be for others in uh, appropriate positions of authority to decide what to do. But let me put all of this conversation into a broader global context because it's the missing part of the debate very often in this country. Often in the media, often in the decision-making process, one seems to get the impression that this decision on what to do is a sort of hermetically sealed decision, that the United States somehow can decide for itself what will happen. It can't. What we are talking about are acts that potentially give rise to international crimes. And in that context, the United States does not have an unfettered discretion in what it can do. It has international obligations, and if it acts in a particular direction, the direction of inaction, that will cause others to act. 